Hi, guys. Uh, how's it going? Uh, yeah, I'm Niall, um, and today I want to talk to you about how we can use Bayesian optimization um, to, uh, to kind of configure neural networks and how we can kind of get the best out of them using uh, a different approach to what traditional methods are. Um, so yeah, just a bit about me at the start. Um, I'm currently a machine learning engineer at, at Argos. Uh, I work in the supply replenishment and forecasting team there. Um, so working on kind of demand forecasting methods um, and kind of everything that's associated with that. Uh, previously, I was a data scientist at an enterprise search company called Lucidworks. Um, and then previous to that, I've kind of experienced in then statistics and mathematics. Um, so what I want to go through today then, um, we'll go through a brief kind of high level overview of what neural networks are, uh, then a bit deeper dive into what convolutional neural networks are and what, how we can use those. Um, and then following on from that, how we can then tune those, tune those models um, using Bayesian optimization and then hopefully we can then get to a demo of how we then can implement that uh, in Python. Um, so yeah, I suppose just a quick show of hands, who, who has kind of background or kind of has uh, experience uh, working with convolutional neur neural networks or neural networks in, in Keras or has used Keras before? Okay, so yeah, a few. Um, worry not, if, if not, we'll, we'll kind of go a high level step through uh, each of the different aspects and yeah, build up a bit of basic intuition what neural networks are and then how we can use uh, optimization in that. So, what is a neural network? This is kind of your very generic uh, neural network. It's been actually around since the 1960s. Um, this is called a multi-layer perceptor whereby you have this kind of hidden layer in the middle and everything's connected together. So, uh, taking a very kind of toy example uh, from the MNIST set. So, MNIST is this kind of universally known uh, data set which is used to kind of benchmark uh, machine learning models. It's, uh, it's basically handwritten digits from zero to nine. Um, and it's classically used to, to see how we can, uh, how our models perform and uh, basically it's yes, as as an image recognition problem. Uh, so yeah, if we're, if we're putting in our digits, we're feeding them into to our network. Basically everything here is kind of connected together and these are kind of weights between what we input, uh, what's inside and then what we're then output. So what we're then outing, outputting is, uh, is 10 different classes and then we're assigning probabilities to each of those classes. Uh, hopefully then being able to assign the highest probability to what we have them in input uh, and then forming some kind of loss uh, towards what we've input. Basically this is kind of an iterative process whereby we're throwing in our data, we're iterating over all the data, uh, we're outputting what our, what our class, what we think our class is, uh, we're, we're then logging what our loss function is or what our loss is and then we're going back and then updating uh, our weights within the model itself uh, and we're updating that by some kind of uh, gradient descent or like back propagation um, and then kind of iterating over it um, and then logging this loss and then hopefully we should get some kind of loss function which kind of goes down and then also converges. Um, so what we should ideally get then is uh, a loss curve, uh, an accuracy curve that looks a bit like this. Um, so here we have training loss, we have validation loss. Um, so basically, it, typically in machine learning, we'll, we'll have our training, training data and we'll have our test data. So our test is what we hold out and what we're, we're testing our, our model against. And training data is what we're, we're training our, our, our actual model on. We can then actually split this training data down into training and validation. So we're going to hold this out this further validation data to, to see how our model's doing. Basically, it's kind of an iterative process, as I say, to, to see how it's performing. So with our loss, we should see it hopefully going down and converging to a certain point. And with our accuracy, which is kind of essentially the converse of our loss, we should see it going up um, and also and also converging to a certain point. Um, if we see these kind of plots diverging, it's it's evidence of overfitting. So whereby our model is 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 training itself on the the training data, and it's becoming not generalizable. So when it's when we're training it, when we're testing against the validation data, it's not doing so well. Um, so. With that high level view of uh, with that high level view of what uh, what neural network is um, what is a convolutional neural network and and then how can we then train that so basically a convolutional neural network it, it involves these series of what are called convolutions um, and uh, this might be a bit uh, <laughs> uh, this uh, this uh, sorry this might be a bit daunting 
at first first look, but we'll kind of break down step by step, um, and basically we'll, we'll give you a kind of high level intuition of, of what's going on. Um, so basically, the convolution neural networks are really effective at image recognition and classification problems, which is what our problem at hand will be. Um, so starting at the start, what, how does, how does our, our, our model see data itself? So <laughs> excuse this kind of uh, vibe image, but uh, effectively any kind, of, any kind of picture or image can be uh, represented as a matrix of, of, of values. Uh, so here we have, going back to our handwritten digits, we have our uh, we have our hand drawn eight, and effectively we can we can represent that as a matrix of values whereby we're uh, we're representing white space as a zero up to two hundred and fifty five, which is basically it's it's a it's a measurement of the intensity of that pixel. Uh, so here we have our it's an eighteen by eighteen grid, and each of those values is a value from zero to two hundred and fifty five, um, gauging the intensity of of that of that pixel. So traditionally, neural networks uh, have effectively what is tunnel vision, whereby we're feeding in data that's perfectly centered. Um, so each time that we're, we're, each time the network is seeing that perfectly centered image, it's classifying that as, as one instance, um, meaning that it doesn't generalize well on images whereby that data is not uh, perfectly centered. So if we, if we show it uh, test data that is perfect center, it'll do really well. For anything else, it's going to be way off. Um, so how can we then solve this? I mean, there's definitely ways to brute force it in the sense that we can add more layers to our network, uh, or we can augment that data um, and then duplicate it to make kind of uh, much more training data to work off and effectively learn if that is, is in a different position, it's still in it. But how can we uh, make a smarter way to do that? And that comes in the form of convolution. Um, so taking this very generic kind of picture of, of a kid on a, a toy horse, um, as a human, we inst instantly recognize kind of the inheritance of, of that picture. We see the kid in, on the top of the horse, the horse on the grass. We, we, we see the, the kid in the, the backyard. But the important thing here is that we recognize the idea or the concept of, of the child, regardless of the background that, that, that we see the, the child in. Basically, what this is called is translation invariance, uh, and it's it's essentially the concept that, regardless of wherever we see that child on whatever background, we still recognise the idea of the concept of a child. So, how can we then translate that into our model itself? Um, and going back to kind of our eight recognizer, how can we then tell that model that that is an eight, regardless of wherever it is within that image? Um, so yeah, we need to then get some way of getting translation invariance into our model. So to do this, um, convolution is a solution. Uh, so very high level view of how this works. I'll skip the maths because I suppose in the interest of time and to make this a bit more uh, engaging. So basically if we take our, our, our image of the child, convolution essentially works as, it works as a sliding window over, over the image itself. So if we think about, we're, we've split, split that image down into grids we're, we're scanning over and moving that grid over, over the image itself. And effectively what this does is that it learns concepts from the image and then it boils them down, it distills them down. So we're kind of shrinking our space and, and distilling it every time. So back to, to our, our initial original um, convolution kind of setup. Um, we're seeing that each time we're, we're, we're layering up these convolutions. So we're, we're laying convolutions another thing called pooling. And basically each time, the kind of the overarching concept of this is that at each level, we're, uh, we're taking some kind of notion or some kind of concept within the image and then distilling it down each time. And then at the end, we're just going to condense this all together in this, in this flat and fully connected layer. And then we're going to output, as we saw originally from our, our, our original model, um, again, some kind of probability towards the class of what we believe the model is predicting. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of the very high level view of, of what a convolution neural network is. But the tricky thing is, how do we then construct the, the right uh, convolutional neural network? Um, so within itself, you saw how there was many, many layers. And basically, you can layer as many of these layers uh, as you want. Um, if I just quickly rewind to this, um, basically how it works is that at each layer, you can, you can learn some kind of concept. So if we take this, this picture of the car, 
uh, in this first layer. It might learn some kind of concept of a round shape in the next layer. It might learn kind of the concept of a wheel that is inherited through, through its concept of, of a round shape. And then onto the next layer, it might recognize the concept of a car, which it is recognized from the concept of a wheel. So you kind of, you're layering off that. And you can, you can have as many layers as you want, but with each of these layers comes a multitude of hyperparameters that you can then tune. So uh, things such as the number of layers that you want, um, number of convolution filters, which is essentially what, how, how many um, outputs you have from each of those convolutions. Um, things like the number of epochs, so that's the number of times that you're iterating and basically updating your model. Uh, things like batch size, activation function. So basically, it runs into kind of millions, the actual, the number of configurations that you can then have, which is why neural networks are so notoriously difficult to, uh, to, to train. And basically, it's, it's a trial and error process. Um, and like sometimes, just by tweaking high parameters, uh, by slight amount, amount sorry, uh, you can get vastly different results. Um, so how do we then find these optimal hyperparameters? So uh, the actual method, methodology by which we try to find optimal hyperparameters is called hyperparameter optimization. Um, and traditionally, the, there are there there are kind of two ones that stand out, which are kind of widely used across all widely across all machine learning. Um, algorithms where, whereby we have some kind of high parameter that we want to tune. And that's uh, grid search and random search. Um, grid search itself involves laying over a grid over the, the domain of possible values uh, that, you, that you have to tune. And just running over that, so exhaustively running over that grid, um, which uh, as you can probably guess is, it's computationally, it, it, it's a lot to do, but it's actually very parallelizable in the sense that you can just distribute it across and, and run over it quickly. Um, but you can often miss miss the optimal values, um, which and then at the same time the actual parameter space uh, grows exponentially with the number of high parameters that you then have to tune. So you run into kind of uh, uh, o n to the k time complexity in the sense that if you have n number of hyperparameter options for k number of hyperparameters, the actual space grows exponentially. Um, another option which <laughs> as it, it seems very basic, it's, it's simply random search. So basically, you have your domain space, uh, you, you specify some kind of probability distribution to sample from, um, and eff effectively, you hope to randomly land on, on the optimal value. Um, I suppose if, if you kind of liken the process of finding the optimal hyperparameter to if you're surve surveying a landscape and you're wanting to find the kind of the peak of the mountain out there, uh, grid search would involve laying a grid over that whole, whole area and going specifically along the grid and hoping, hoping to get to the, the peak of the mountain. Random search would involve, I suppose, if you're like jumping out of a, a plane multiple times and hoping to land on, on the mountain, the tip of the mountain. So it's, uh, as well as these, model, uh, as these uh, opt uh, sorry, these tuning uh, algorithms work, um, they leave a bit to be desired. So how can we then leverage what we've previously learned um, into, into making a more intuitive decision about what hyperparameters to, to look at next. Um, and that comes in the, fall, the form of Bayesian optimization. So, I mean, there's actually a, a whole field of statistics dedicated to Bayesian optimization. Um, again, I'll keep it very light on the maths um, and just build that very high level concept of and an intuition around the actual framework of, of how we do Bayesian optimization. So, what is Bayesian optimization? It's, it's a very powerful tool for basically. Um, globally optimizing any objective function. So in the case of our neural network, it's going to be our, our loss function. Uh, and functions specifically, which are very costly or uh, are slow to evaluate. So in, this is extremely pertinent, I suppose, in, this, in, the, in the context of our, our neural network, in that neural networks are relatively, um, take quite long to train. Um, so it, it's not very efficient to simply just grid, uh, grid search or random search if it's taking so long to iterate and train the model each time. Um, so Bayesian optimization falls within, within a class of, of optimization algorithms called sequential model-based algorithms, or sorry, optimization. Uh, sequential in the sense that you're leveraging what you've previously seen, so kind of your history of, of what you've seen. Uh, model-based in the sense that we're going to uh, build uh, some kind of surrogate or proxy function, which we will then optimize itself, so you're taking you're taking what you're seeing, and you're creating a surrogate function, which is that surrogate function that you'll then optimize. Uh, 
So kind of mathematically, if we have our loss function in the case of our neural network, which is f of x, we want to find the arguments or the hybrid parameters that will minimize that loss function. Uh, so to do Bayesian optimization itself, just very simply, uh, you initialize a Gaussian process on a small, like an initial small set of, of samples from our domain. Um, and that itself enables us to compute a prior probability model. Um, and then we're going to sequentially uh, select new locations at each step um, in the domain by optimizing our surrogate function, which is called an acquisition function. And then basically then we're going to iterate it each time and then we're going to update that prior probability distribution to update our belief of what we believe uh, our loss function, our objective function looks like um, having computed it. So basically we're leveraging what we've previously seen before um, and saying to ourselves, given what I've seen before, what do I feel is the next best possible set of uh, hyperparameter configuration that will, will minimize that loss. Um, so a key concept of that is, is that it's a Gaussian process. Um, so a Gaussian process is essentially a generalized uh, version of the Gaussian distribution or normal distribution, but it effectively is it's a distribution over function. So as we see here, uh, we uh, assume that then our, our loss function is Gaussian process distributed with with mean a mean function u x and then a covariance uh, a covariance function x x prime. So this is also called the kernel or, or, or uh, covariance function, and basically it describes the, the kind of smoothness and different properties of of our loss function. Um, and the important thing about this is that it induces a posterior distribution. Uh, that's analytically uh, tractable. Um, so it means that each time we can then update what we've previously seen before and leverage our historical data. Um, so yeah, just quickly what an acquisition function is. It's the thing, the proxy function that we're gonna be quickly updating. Uh, so it comes in kind of three different flavors, which is expected improvement, upward confidence bound, and maximum probability of improvement. Um, so basically this axis is a function of the posterior which we're then going to continue to update. And the thing that we want to kind of balance and trade off is exploration versus exploitation. Uh, exploitation in the sense that we're going to continually look at values that we know already know the maximum of, or are we going to exploit and go, sorry, explore and go to different uh, regions where we have higher variance. So just a really quick um, one-dimensional example of how this works. So we have this, this one-dimensional function uh, where the maximum is two. Uh, x equals two, and we're, we're going to bound it between uh, minus two and ten, uh, and then we're going to initialize initially with with our two spots, and then at each time we have our we have if we see just below, that's our uh, our acquisition function, and at each step we want to maximize that utility, so we're going to sample, uh, we're going to sample, we're going to see we're going to we're essentially just probing probing the function, and it's, it's important to know here that. Prior to this, we don't know the function itself. We only know, we only gauge what the function is through probing points, uh, and then a, we're, we're then gauging our expected improvement, seeing where to go next. Uh, so we want to go like x equals four. Uh, our next point is going to be at x ten, and we're just iterating over and over again. And quickly, we uh, we get towards towards our maximum, which is x equals two. So kind of putting this all together, if we have many, many hyperparameters, um, how can we then gauge uh, what the, the optimal set of hyperparameters is? Um, and this leads us on to the demo. So basically, uh, what we'll uh, look at will be an image classification problem, which is it's going to use the fashion MNIST set. So where we had handwritten ditches, which is the original MNIST uh, uh, set, uh, we'll have 60,000 training ex examples of, of effectively grayscale um, pictures of clothes, uh, which was released by uh, the fashion online company uh, Zalando. And it's the same kind of setup as, as the M MNIST in that there's 60,000 training examples, 10,000 test examples, and each is a grayscale uh, picture of uh, 28 by 28 pixels. Um, so, so, sorry, is that one minute? Yeah, until questions. Oh, okay, cool, cool. So if I could then just quickly run through, uh, sorry, I've run a bit over. Um, so basically, yeah, if you want to go to this GitHub as well, uh, so it's just Nile Turb forward slash uh, pylon dinium, you'll find the demo as well as, as, as what we've just previously went through. Um, perfect. 
perfect. Um, so what I'm using here um, is actually it's Google Colab. So effectively, it's, it's kind of Google's VM in the cloud. And it actually, especially for machine learning tasks, um, it allows you to use a GPU in the cloud, which is actually really, uh, it's really cool. Um, and this is essentially just a, a, an IPython notebook. Um, the same IPython notebook, which is, which is on GitHub for anyone that wants to check it out. So <laughs> running through what we have here, uh, quickly as I'm conscious of time. Uh, so using Keras, uh, which is kind of, it's a, it's a it effectively learns us to quickly train uh, deep learning models. Uh, we'll do our imports. Um, also, just a note here, I'm setting random seeds. So usually in, in deep learning models, you don't actually use you don't. You wouldn't normally set seed as um, as as uh, the neural network actually inherently replies on. It, sorry, it relies on randomness within it. Uh, so, so just defining our fashion MNIST class, uh, we'll specify our inputs. So basically, these are going to be the parameters that we're going to hype uh, that we're going to optimize. Uh, so I'm going to use a kind of widely known uh, architecture for 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 image re image recognition and classification, uh, whereby you kind of stack a few convolutions on top of each other, have a couple of dense layers, and then output your prediction. So here we have basically the the number of convolutions that you have. So basically, what's what's coming out? Uh, dropout, which is a, it's a method of it's preventing your model from overfitting, uh, whereby at each convolution you, you kind of just drop uh, a certain amount. So I've, I've just set these to default values, which are then going to be the, the values that we optimize. Um, so firstly, loading the data itself. The actual fashion MNIST data can be loaded uh, within Keras itself. Um, we're going to specify we're going to specify the shape of our, uh, our, uh, our inputs. It's going to be actually just one. Uh, so the depth is only going to be one, because uh, it's, it's a black, black and white image. If it was colored, we'd have three different uh, filters, or three different layers, sorry. Uh, we reshape. Um, we divide then by 255 to normalize the data, because we're, our da data, our pixel values are, are ranged from 0 to 255. Um, and then we then construct the architecture of, of the actual neural network itself. So we're, we're layering these convolutions. And then adding these two dense layers. Um, so at each convolution, you have this convolution, which is where we're scanning over, uh, the kernel size being basically the grid that you're scanning across. Uh, we're output, outputting our shape. Um, we're using then this activation function. So within neural networks, you have what's called these activation functions, which is, are kind of nonlinear transforms. Um, OK. Um, sorry, I've kind of run out of time here. But that's all on GitHub if you want to run through it. It's pretty self-intuitive. And it's, I've commented everything through it. but. Um, yeah, sorry, I've run a bit over. Um, if anyone has any questions, just catch me outside at the end. Um, yeah, thank you.